Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Jaya Gaudam Follow on your phones, yeah. Go. It's Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu.
Shri Vasari Gaura Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hari 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 Rama Hari Ram 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 Hari Hari hmm. Every religious major religious scripture has a particular verse which really illustrates or identifies the essence of that scripture. You find that in all major scriptures. That 
It's, uh, it's a particular terminology that is given to that verse, which right now has slipped my mind, but I can't remember what it's called. But it, it indicates the meaning of the actual scripture. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, Ete Cham Sam Kalam Pum Sam Krishna's Tu Bhagavan Swayam, that out of all of the manifestation incarnations of Krishna, which are portions and plenary portions of the Supreme Lord, the actual Supreme Personality of Godhead, is Sri Krishna, <laughs> which is the foundation by which the whole Bhagavatam is expressed that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and the goal is devotional service to the Supreme Lord to understand him and ultimately to develop love for him. <laughs> but also you find there is another, there are other verses which kind of illustrate the essence of the whole process of bhakti. There's one verse here, which is the last verse in the whole Srimad Bhagavatam. And this is the title, and this chapter is titled, The Glories of Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's from the 12th canto, 13th chapter, verse 23. Nama Sankirtana Yasya Papa Sarva Papa Panasanam Pranamo Dukkha Samanas Tum Namami Harim Param Translation, I offer my respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Lord Hari, the congregational chanting of whose holy name destroys all sinful reactions and the offering of obeisances unto whom rel relieves all material suffering. There's no purport. <laughs> it's, the, it's the conclusion. So here, after narrating various topics, such as the creation, sub-creation, the incarnations of the Lord, uh, the, um, the mercy of the Lord in different manifestations, and the, um, oh, actually, give me the uh, second canto. Yeah. In that second canto, there's a particular verse that talks about the 10 topics that cover Srimad Bhagavatam. It's interesting to hear these 10 topics because then you know what is the essence of this, this the subject matters of Krishna. Second canto? No second canto. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a nice verse. Second Canto, 10th chapter, verse number one. Two ten one. Get it there. Two ten one here. Okay. Atarva sargam visargos cha stanam posanam utayan manvantare sanu kanta niroda mukta asrayam. Sukadeva Goswami said in the Srimad Bhagavata there are ten divisions of statements regarding the following the creation of the universe, sub creation, planetary systems protection by the Lord, the creative impetus, the change of Manu, the science of God, and returning back home, back to Godhead, liberation, and the sunambolam. Sunambolam means the actual goal of life. Now these are the 10 foundational topics by which Bhagavad expands itself into different categories. But these are the essence. But Srila Prabhupada has actually said that when he was asked, why do you write so many verses? Why do you give so many purports under the... What is the purpose of all of your writing? Prabhupada said, the purpose of all my writing is to get people to chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> yeah. That was his ultimate statement. And so, because Lord Chaitanya has come as the Yuga avatar, <laughs> Krishna Varnam, Tvasa Krishna, Sangopanga, 
Saparsadam Yagyai Sankirtanai Prayai Yajanti Hi Sumeda Saha. Sri Krishna Mahaprabhu has come. He's come for six reasons. This is, I mean, as you go into the etymological essence of his practice, you find that there are six reasons, three external and three internal. The internal reasons are not so much known by devotees, but they're mentioned in the beginning of the fourth chapter, in the fourth chapter of the Adi Lila, wherein is one particular story that goes back even because the Lord comes every once in every 1,000 yuga cycles. So he comes to every 4,320,000,000 years, and that's a 1,000 yuga cycles. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come in this particular Kali Yuga, and that was right on clockwork. It's, four, it's been 4,320,000,000 since his last manifestation. And he comes for six reasons. And that's mentioned where uh, Lochan Das Thakur in his writing of Chaitanya Mangala explains that uh, Krishna was with Rukmini in his palace in Dwarka. And Rukmini is his principal queen. She is an expansion of the, the, the uh, Gopi Chandravali. All of the queens are expansions of Krishna's gopis, the 16,108, you might say, prominent gopis, expanded into the 16,108 queens of Dwarka. Because the gopis are the original manifestations of all the female, man uh, female expansions, and they all ultimately come from Srimati Radharani. So she's the source of the Lakshmis, and she's the source of the queens, and she's also the source of the gopis. And the reason why Krishna wants to enjoy in a variety of ways, so in order to facilitate that Radharani expanse into so many manifestations of female, manif of female counterparts of the Supreme Lord, either as Narayan Lakshmi, Lakshmi Narayan, or Dwarkadish, and ultimately Rukmini, Rukmini Dwarka dish. And then, of course, the Krishna, Radha Krishna, and Vrindavan. So, Krishna was his, what his principal queen in, in Dwarka, who was Rukmini. And she's very sweet, and she's very gentle, and she's not contrary. Contrary means and some of the gopis fight with Krishna, they argue with Krishna, and they because Krishna likes that, <laughs> makes life exciting. If you're married, once in a while it's good to have a nice little fight with your wife, which is because it gives a little, you know, interest to the. Or otherwise, things will get dull, you know. But it's 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 like Prabhupada said, that kind of fight is like two kittens. <laughs> They're just fighting, and nobody takes it seriously. <laughs> and so, you know, Krishna likes that, but. There are manifestations of the female counterparts that are very obedient to Krishna, and Rukmini is the topmost. So she's massaging Krishna's feet, and she's feeling really happy and experiencing so much emotional happiness from him massaging Krishna's feet. Krishna's noticing that, and then she starts to express her feelings. She says, my dear Lord, you don't know how wonderful you are. You don't know, she keeps saying it over and over again. She's shedding tears and giving her love and massaging his feet. And she said, you don't know how wonderful your lotus feet are. And then Krishna starts to think, I don't know how wonderful I am. <laughs> That's a problem, I have to find out. <laughs> I'll just sidetrack a little bit. There's one time Krishna's walking in Dwarka and he passes a reflective pillar. And then he goes back and he think, he saw the reflection as he passed and he think, who is that? That person's really beautiful. And he goes back and he think, oh, that's me. <laughs> Don't try it. 
doesn't, doesn't work. <laughs> It'll be more like a, a humorous affair. <laughs> but when Krishna actually is attracted to himself because he, he's the source of everything <laughs> that's attractive. And so when Rukmini is expressing, then she at one point she says, there is only one person who knows how wonderful you are, only one. And then he wants to know. And then she says, Srimati Radharani, no one else. Hmm. So the Lord is now reflecting. I have to find out how wonderful I am. But in order for me to do that, I have to become Radharani. And he can do that, but therefore the manifestation of Lord Chaitanya is he's Krishna with her mood. She Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nahyanya. He is Krishna, but he's in the mood of Srimati Radharani. He's in the mood of pure devotion to himself. That's why this incarnation of Lord Chaitanya is very mysterious, but at the same time very magnanimous also. So in trying to understand himself, he manifests himself in that in incarnation as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And there's three things he wants to know, which are the three elements of how wonderful he is. What is the, what is the nature of her love for him? What is the happiness that she's experiencing in that loving relationship? And what is about him, her, what is about him that attracts her to him? So these are the three internal reasons. What is the nature of her love? What is the, ex what is the happiness she's experienced in that? And what is about him that is so attractive? So he can't do that from his position, so he has to take her position in order to do that. That's Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So these are the internal reasons. The external reasons are that when uh, Advaita Charya manifested himself before Lord Chaitanya came in the area of Navadvip. And um, he is a, he's a manifestation of Sadashiva and Mahavishnu in one incarnation. And so he came and in the mood of Sadashiva, he's compassionate to the fallen souls. But at that time, Navadweep was very materialistic. Although it was the bastion of education, it was also very, people were very materialistic. They were worshiping demigods. They were, they were spending large amounts of money on weddings. They were even doing weddings for cats and dogs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would spend <coughs> money for, to, to marry cats. And, yeah, and it's mentioned in, in uh, Chaitanya Bhagavan. How, and then they were also worshiping demigods for material benefits. They would create a deity, a deity of the demigod and worship, get some material benefit, then take the deity and throw it in the Ganga because it was no needed anymore. So he was seeing this and hardly anyone, although a few, were, not perform, were performing devotional service. So in this mood of uh, Sadashiva, he was thinking, I should just kill them all. <laughs> That's what he was thinking. But then again, he, he thought again. So he said, this is actually the work of the Supreme Lord. And so he went down to the banks of the Ganga and established a Shalagran Shila and started to offer very heartfelt prayers, calling the Lord and offering flowers, Tulsi leaves and sandalwood to the Shalagram Shila. This went on for some time, calling very loudly for the Lord to come and incarnate and save all of these foolish people. So that was one of the reasons why the Lord manifests, and that's the er external reason. And we mentioned the three internal reasons. Another one of the external reasons is, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharata mabhuta nama dharmasya tadatvanam sujami aham pravitranayam sarunam vinasana chaduskritam dharma samstarpanarta yam brahm sambhavami yuge yuge. Whenever there's a decline 
and religious principles and an increase of irreligion, I come to reestablish the Dharma and remove irreligion. So that was the second reason he appeared. And the third reason is to establish the Yuga Dharma, uh, the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So these are the six reasons why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came. It's important to understand who Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is before we worship him. He's in the mood of a devotee, but he is the Supreme Lord himself. And he performed many of the pastimes that we perform as devotees, just as an example to teach from the position of the, the, the master how the student should behave. And one of the main things he did was have kirtan. <laughs> he always wanted kirtan. You just, there is a, a scripture that describes his daily activities when he would wake up in the morning and he would take his bath and then he would go out with his devotees and they would chant and dance in the village. The first thing he'd do, they would go, Udila Aruna Gaudana Bhaji Dvijamani Gauda Amani Jage Tattari Tattari Bhaji Loro Gana Gana Dharamaji Loro and then it's a beautiful song. When I first joined the Hare Krishna movement, we used to sing this bhajan every day, every morning. It was part of our morning program, yeah. And it's about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu with his, with his followers going through the village and just singing and dancing and saying, wake up sleeping souls, wake up. You're sleeping on the lap of the Maya witch. <laughs> this human form of life, you're wasting it simply for you know, pound, shilling, and pence. <laughs> no, try to make money, that's all. Papa said, the only person who's making money is the government. <laughs> they, they print it all the time, you know. <laughs> they have their printing presses. <laughs> so, yeah, so the Mahaprabhu goes out every day, and after chanting a while in the villages, people come up and they look, oh, there he is, there's Vishwambar, he's chanting. And then their whole day starts off so nicely. And then he goes down to the banks of the river and he takes his bath, comes out, and puts on sandalwood and gets the nice fresh clothes, goes back to his house, takes Maha Prashadam, and then goes out again. <laughs> and this goes on through the whole day. The Lord is just practically performing kirtan throughout the whole day. So Mahaprabhu came to may show the importance of how kirtan is in our practice of Krishna consciousness. It's the essence, really, much. That's that verse, Krishna varnam tusa krishna sangopargo saparsadam yagyai. So yagya, one has to perform yagya. Unless one performs yagya, one cannot practice spiritual life. And the scriptures are full of all kinds of yagyas, you know. These are different yagyas for different functions in order for, to bring auspiciousness and to raise one's consciousness from the material to the mode of goodness and also, also to the mood of transcendence. But in this age, no one can perform these yagyas because the Brahmins are not here. You have to chant perfectly the mantras in order for the yagyas to be if any of the any one of the letters in the mantras were chanted wrongly, the whole yagya would be foiled. We have the example in the sixth canto when uh, Twasta wanted to uh, avenge his father's death. Uh, what was Vishwarup? When uh, Indra killed Vishwarup, he wanted to create a demon to kill Indra. So he started to chant a mantra to produce the demon, but he made a mistake in the, in the mantra. Instead of chanting a l long A, he chanted a short A. No, just like the, when you see a line over the, la the letter, that's, that means it's emphasized. And there's no line, it's not emphasized. So that was the only mistake he made in the home. And so he got a demon that was going to be killed by Indra instead of a demon to kill Indra. So the yogi came out differently. 
Um, that's how precise these Vedic mantras are. That, and therefore, in previous ages, the Brahmins could chant perfectly the slokas. Now we can't even chant. We, we make so many mistakes in our chanting. But Krishna is Baba Grihi Janardana. He's very merciful. He knows what you're trying to say. And so in this age, we're not held responsible as long as we try to chant our best. But if we were, if it was previous ages, we would get nothing out of our devotional service if we were, if we were chanting wrongly. This age, there's concessions. So like that, just like we chant the Hare Krishna mantra, sometimes we chant it wrong. Sometimes we leave out one of the words, or we chant Ramo instead of Rama. <laughs> it's become quite profuse now in our society, Ramo. Who's Ramo? Some Italian barber or something? <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada shot that down when he first came up. He chastised one of the biggest kirtan leaders in our movement. He said, don't chant this Ramo, it'll spoil everything. Yeah, very heavy. He said, it's a, it's a Vedic mantra, it's not a Bengali mantra. <laughs> you know, in Bengal, they chant all the A's or O's, right? That's just the way it is. <laughs> but then it's not a Bengali mantra, it's a Sanskrit mantra. And so it has to be chanted accordingly. So yeah, it's just to use an example of how the, the chanting of the mantras in the previous ages were quite precise. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come to deliver that mantra which is called Maha Mantra. Why is it called Maha Mantra as opposed to Mantra? What is the uh, actual understanding? Well, the end of understanding is ma many of the mantras have other words in the mantra that are not indicating of the Supreme, or they indicate the Supreme Lord but are not the Supreme Lord. But in the Maha Mantra, all the names of the Supreme Lord. Hare, Krishna, and Rama. Hari is the energy of the Lord. It's actually Srimati Radharani. And um, Rama is there. And then Hare. So that, that's why it's Maha Mantra. There is no other words in the mantra that are not directly the names of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's the difference. And when we chant the Maha Mantra, we're chanting the, the highest and most purest of all mantras. And therefore, when we chant, it's really an opportunity to really purify our consciousness. Because it, ch it says if you chant one name, not just one mantra, one name, purely, all sinful reactions of all of your previous karma is completely destroyed simply by one, one name chanted perfectly. We have the example, it's in the sixth canto of Bhagavatam, Ajamil. He chanted the name Narayan purely, but he chanted in Namabhas. That means he, he wasn't chanting to get something from the chanting. He chanted to call out for his son. His son was named Narayan. He was 88 years old. He had a son when he was 86. He named him Narayan. Fortunately, by the grace of God, some sadhu came to his house when his mother, when his wife was pregnant. She said, name your, he said, name your next son Narayan. And that was God's arrangement because he wanted to bring him back after he had left his, <coughs> his devotional life behind when he was a young man and took up the life of a debauch. But fortunately, by the grace of the Lord, when he was dying, he called out Narayan, but he was calling for his son. But he called in Namabhas, that means he called without any aparad. There was no offense in that chanting. And simply by doing that, all of the sinful reactions that he had committed were gone. Now, we can't actually live like that. In other words, it's not that you Say, well, ha ha, now I got the formula. Yeah. I can do all kinds of nonsense, and then when I get old, I'll just chant Hare Krishna. Mm. That doesn't work because Krishna knows your intention. <laughs> but 
if you sincerely practice Krishna consciousness and you don't make it purely at the time of death, but at the time of death you chant, you know, helplessly, then you, uh, all of that can be wipe, wiped away within an instant. That is the power of the holy name. So this holy name is actually very, very powerful. It's not just some nice musical rendition that we feel happy doing. It's actually the topmost way to glorify the Lord. And we use that word in a very strong way, topmost, because there's no better way to glorify the Lord in this age than to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. No, the, 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 the Vedas are full of mantras. In fact, the whole, the whole Yajur Veda is just mantras. Sama Veda, mantras mostly. Most of the Vedas are just mantras on different, in order to achieve different purposes or to raise one's consciousness from one level of worship to a higher level of worship. But the Maha Mantra is a pure sound vibration of Krishna's name that when chanted with the desire to please Krishna and to purify our hearts, then that's why Prabhupada said, you know, there is a class of people who practice spiritual life in order to get liberation. What does liberation mean? It means freedom from material suffering or from freedom from all material activities. And so, but Prabhupada said, when you're engaged in devotional service, you're liberated. Devotional service is on the liberated platform. And even though you may not know it, you are already liberated from the material energy if you stay on that platform of devotion. So liberation is a byproduct, just like Bilba Mangala Thakur writes a beautiful prayer. Mukti and Bukti are standing at my door with folded hands asking, can, how can I serve you? Mukti, liberation, Bukti, material happiness. So if we perform devotional service, there's no need to chase after material happiness or try to reduce the, the, form, the forms of suffering in this world because automatically, through devotional service, all of that will automatically happen. Mukti and bhakti follow bhakti. But it's not that bhakti follows mukti and bhakti. <laughs> bhakti is the supreme because bhakti is the supreme internal energy of the Lord manifested by Srimati Radharani. She is, she is Bhakti Devi. When we chant the Pranam prayers, we say, Tulsi Devi Ki Jai, Bhakti Devi Ki Jai. That Bhakti Devi refers to Srimati Radharani. And she stands there with her hands like this, and she's doing two things. Bhakti Tirta Swami would always give this explanation. If you're not, if you're trying to worship the Lord for material benefits, this hand means Stop. Don't go any, don't try to go any farther. And otherwise, if you're in the right consciousness, she's giving blessings and encouraging you and also blessing you in your efforts like that. So that's right, Srimati Radharani. And if you get Radharani's blessings, you get Krishna's mercy automatically. It's not, not that you have to try for Krishna's mercy. Of course, Radharani's mercy comes from Guru's mercy, and Guru's mercy comes from Nityananda, and Nityananda gets his mercy from Lord Chaitanya. <laughs> so it's a whole process of receiving mercy from different levels of spiritual personalities. But the supreme mercy is to enter into the mood of Vrindavan, which is that means in, into the pastimes of Radha and Krishna and Vrindavan. And that is the goal. Uh, Ram Yakash, what was that verse we were singing today? Um, Ram Yak uh, we were looking at it this morning, right? Ram Yakash, Rajabadu, Kopi. That's from the Chaitanya Man Manush Madusha by Ch Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur. Yeah. And so that is actually Lord Chaitanya's teachings to bring us to the platform of worshiping the Lord in Sri Vrindavan Dham. And that's what the Maha Mantra is. The Maha Mantra contains all of the pastimes, 
all of the qualities, all of the forms, all of the names of the Lord. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given that. Nam nam akari bahutan nija sarva shaktis. When he's saying sarva shaktis, Lord Chaitanya is saying all, not just some, all of all of the energies, qualities, pastimes, names, forms, Everything of the absolute truth is found in Krishna's name. Why? Because it's the mercy manifestation in this age and it's non different than Krishna. Abhidna Tvam Nami Nami No. The name in Krishna is the same. So one who seriously chants the holy names of the Lord will, will gradually come to the platform of pure devotional service. So we have to take this chanting very seriously and not just as a side act that we do every one when we got some time. <laughs> it is actually the essence of our spiritual development like that. And the scriptures are full. Uh, if you read Chaitanya Macharitamrita, especially the seventh chapter of Adi Lila, the whole chapter is about the glorification of the Holy Name. Like that. And throughout the scriptures, it's there. So some people from the outside would think, well, it's just singing or dancing. And just like we were doing that yesterday, Jai, Sisi Gorda, Tai, Ki Jai. We were doing it now and people are attracted. Oh, these people are happy, look at them, they're singing and dancing. But what are we doing? We're not just singing and dancing, we're worshiping the Lord in his, in his, on, the, on the ultimate principle of glorification. That is chanting his holy name. That's a foundation for actually making all spiritual advancement. That's why Prabhupada would say, just chant Hare Krishna, that's all. <laughs> well, he made the point, it's not that that's all we do, but everything is there in the holy name. Your understanding of Bhagavatam, your association with the quality of your association with devotees. What else? Um, the ability to worship the Lord nicely, doing puja, all of that is centers around the quality of our chanting. Everything comes from chanting. It's like expressed there. So the chanting of the Holy Name is so powerful and so much of a prominent part, part of our practice that as you make advancement in Krishna consciousness, you want to chant more and more. And there's some people that just chant all the time. <laughs> Prabhupada had one, this uh, God brother, Krishna does Babaji Maharaj. <laughs> he would laugh like that. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. <laughs> and he would be laughing and chanting and he do bhajans all the time, and, and Prabhupada loved him. When Prabhupada was getting his uh, sannyas initiation from his uh, senior god of Keshava Maharaj in the, in the Math in uh, Calcutta, uh, Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj was there for the ceremony. And so the, the, the mantras were being chanted and for the initiation. And Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj was doing kirtan in the back with his murdanga. He'd always carry murdanga with him. And uh, and so there was some signal that, you know, you're chanting too loud, we can't really hear the mantras. So they asked him to chant softer. And when Prabhupada heard that, he just looked over at Krishna Das Babaji. <laughs> chant louder. <laughs> and he did. And then Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj said later, I knew he would be successful <laughs> because he understood the chanting of the holy name is everything. <laughs> yeah, he writes about that. So, um, yeah, one time Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj said to one of Prabhupada's god brothers who also came to the West, he also came to London, and he said, uh, it, was, it was coming of a rhetorical statements he made, a little bit in a challenging mood. He said, uh, you went to the West, 
Bhaktivedanta, he also went to the West. And you're a great scholar, and you're a well-known scholar of the Vedas, and he also, he is Bhaktivedanta, scholar of the Vedas. You failed, and he succeeded, why? <laughs> he posed that question to a very senior Prabhupada God brother, and ultimately there was no answer, and then he answered himself because Bhaktivedanta emphasized the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahal Mantra. That's why he was successful. <laughs> and so when you see, when Prabhupada started, what did he do? He, he had a few fledging people, disciples, they were hippies. And they went out into the park and Prabhupada got a little bongo jung, was beating on the drum, and people were gathering. And then some of the devotees were dancing. And that was in the beginning of our the, the kirtan program in the West. And so that expanded out. And, and if you see the old Back to Godhead magazines, all it is is about kirtans in different places around the world. So this chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra is not just part of the process, it is the process. <laughs> of course, we have to follow the rest of the process because it's supportive. And it also is necessary. It's part of our execution of devotional service. But mm, the most important and the foundation for all success in all aspects of uh, our life, both material and spiritual, is chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> and to get absorbed in chanting Hare Krishna means to actually understand what this movement is about. It's about chanting the holy names of the Lord as much as possible. So Prabhupada used to say, when you're actually chanting Hare Krishna, you'll think 16 rounds, why not 16,000? He said, then you're, then you're actually chanting. <laughs> when, you, un, when you get to the point of you're tasting the happiness of that, the holy name. And that comes both with kirtan and with japa, with, the, with japa also. So this is our this is why Mahaprabhu came to benedict the entire world. And he did so many kirtans. There was one particular kirtan. Well, actually, there's a, a pastime that's related to it, where Mahaprabhu was in Jagannath Puri. And Nityananda, he told Nityananda, you stay in Navadvip and you preach. I'll be in Jagannath Puri. Nityananda was feeling really great separation from Mahabhu, Mahaprabhu. He wanted to be with him. So one time during the Rathiyatra ceremony, along with all of the other devotees, he came. And of course, Lord Chaitanya was well, very happy to see him. But then after some time, there was a discussion. And Lord Nityananda, Lord Chaitanya said, you want to be with me and I want to be with you. But we need to preach. We, we, our mission here is to spread the glories of the holy name. So you go back to Navadweep. You take your Gopals and go, because Lord Nityananda is the king of all Gopals. He's Balaram. Brajendra Nandanaye, Sachi Sutta Hoilo Se, Balaram Hoilo Nitai. So Nityananda is Balaram, and Lord Chaitanya is Krishna in the mood of a devotee of Krishna. So when you see those two on the altar, you should think Krishna Balaram. It's not that they are expansions. They are, but they're actually not different. So they've come. And so Lord Chaitanya told, you take your gopas and go back. So he gathered all his gopas and they were heading back to Navadweep, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's a, quite a long ways. So they were going, they were singing and dancing and singing and dancing and chanting and chanting and chanting and dancing and dancing and chanting and chanting and dancing and dancing and dancing and chanting. And after some time they got lost. Where are we? We don't know where we are. They were absorbed in the kirtan. So they asked somebody, where is, which way to Navadweep? Hi, hi! You have to go to that area there, and then you go down. And they were getting directions like that. So, hmm. so they changed directions, and then they started singing and dancing and dancing and singing and singing and dancing and dancing and dancing and dancing and singing and singing and more dancing and more singing. 
And then again, they were lost. They don't know which way to go. So they asked again, Hai, Hai! Follow the route along Ganga. Go to Ganga. 20 miles that way, and then Ganga will lead you to Nava. Oh, okay. And they followed the Ganga. And after some time, they reached to the outskirts of Navadvipa. And they, st they stopped at the house of Raghava Pandit. And Raghava Pandit, he came out, and he had a beautiful garland to greet Lord Nityananda and, and the devotees. And he gave the garland, and but Nityananda said, hmm, give me a garland of Kadamba flowers. Nitai, Kadamba flowers, it's not the season. Go look in your backyard, just go look. So he went into his backyard, and on the lemon tree, there were kadamba flowers. So he picked the flowers, made a garland, came out and gave it to him. And Lord Nityananda was very happy, and then everyone was smelling damanaka flowers. Now, damanaka flowers only grow in the area of Puri. So everyone was thinking, Lord Chaitanya, he wears damanaka garlands all the time. Lord Chaitanya must be here. Because it says whenever Lord, hey, Lord Nityananda dances, Lord Chaitanya is always there. But no one could see him except Lord Nityananda and a very few very advanced devotees. So the Lord was also there in his unmanifested form. So they began kirtan again. And they were singing and dancing and dancing and singing and singing and dancing and dancing and dancing and dancing and singing and singing and more dancing and dancing and singing and having a lot of good fun, chanting and dancing and more. Singing, singing, dancing, and chanting, and chanting, and dancing, and dancing, and dancing, and chanting, and chanting, and singing, and singing. And then they started to really get absorbed, and they had a kirtan, and went on for three months. Three months. Nobody stopped to eat, drink, sleep, or anything. It's mentioned in. In Vrindavan Das of course, Chaitanya Bhagavat, that kirtan went on for three consecutive months. Can you imagine? <laughs> and people were running up the sides of a tree, running out to the ends of the branches, and dancing on the branches. They had became, they defied all of the laws of material energy. They were diving off the branches. One mentioned one devotee, though, he said, I am the monkey soldier, Angada, poom, he would dive off. <laughs> and then they were, and then they were, they got really ecstatic and dancing. They started picking up trees and uprooting them and dancing with the trees, small trees. And then they were, and then the villagers from the area got, what's happening? This kirtan is just going on. So some of the kids in the village, they came out and started to dance and sing. And they were picking up trees, too, these small kids. And they were dancing for one month. Their parents were wondering what happened. <laughs> so this is, this is the power. <laughs> this, this kirtan explains, gives you a little insight of some of the, that's just a small power of the holy name. It's so powerful. You can forget about eating, you can forget about sleeping, forget about everything. When you're absorbed in chanting the holy names of the Lord, you are not in this world at all. <laughs> you are on another level, spiritual level. And so, and it's, and it's, it's an, Kevala Ananda Kanda. That means it's joyfully performed. So after some time, Lord Nityananda stopped the kirtan. That was after three months. And then he went on to Navadweep. And when he got there, people were giving him all kinds of gifts. So they started giving him garlands and very costly garments, jewelry, crowns, ankle bells, and everything. And so he started to wearing all of these things. And he was really doing kirtan with all of his gopals in Navadweep. And he was really like opulent with golden and silver and and jewels and earrings, crowns and everything. And, but there was a series of dacoids. There was one dacoid, he was the head of the gang of dacoids. He was looking, he was thinking, hmm, boy, all of that wealth in one place. 
where we can retire after this one. <laughs> so his program was to try to steal everything from Lord Nityananda. So he made a plan, he called the Dacoits. He said, just see, look at this, everything is there. We, we won't have to you know, continue our nefarious activities. We can, if we can just get this, we can live comfortably the rest of our life. Yeah, so okay. So they made a plan. So that night, the little Lord Nityananda was staying with his Gopals in the house of Jagadish Pandit. So he would go there at night and take prasadam with his devotees, and the next day he would go out with his Gopals. And so the Dakites, Dakoids got ready, and he mentions that each one had five different weapons. <laughs> and they were hiding, they were just waiting for the sun to go down, and then they were gonna attack. But as they were waiting and waiting and waiting, they start getting sleepier and sleepier and sleepier. And every one of them fell asleep. And then they hear, the rooster. <laughs> Did I wake up anybody? No, nobody, okay, everybody's still awake? Okay. And, uh, you fell asleep. No, you fell asleep. You were supposed, no. They started arguing amongst themselves, blaming each other for the fact that they all went to sleep. And the head of the Dhaka, Dhaka says, no, no, it's not like that. We haven't worshiped Chandi Devi. Because we haven't worshiped Chandi Devi, she's not pleased with us. So let's go perform puja to Chandi Devi. She gives her blessings and we'll be successful. She's a demigoddess. She's an expansion of Durga. So they started to worship her nicely, and after many days, they were again ready to go. So this time, they got ready, and that night, so when they came to the house of Jagadish Pandit and they were ready, they saw all of these huge, gigantic sentries carrying huge swords and, and walking around the house where Lord Nityananda and his Gopals were staying. So the head of the Dakoi said, well, the king must be here with his soldiers. So it's not a good time, so let's wait. So they waited another night, and the next night they came back, and they were all ready. And then they went to the house, and they saw that the soldiers were gone, and they, they were all ready this time, so they were waiting. And it was getting, all of a sudden, as they were waiting, it was getting darker and darker and darker and darker. And Indra saw what was happening, so he decided to get involved. So he sent some rain, and it was raining, and really raining, pouring. And then the rain turned to hailstones, big, gigantic, baseball-sized hailstones, crashing down and hitting all of these dacoys. And they, ah, 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 they were, just yelling this way and that way, and they went, ah! And so they didn't know what to do. That one of them was running one. So one ran and he fell into a canal and there was some mosquitoes and scorpions and it was being bit. One ran into a bush and there was all stickers on the bush. He got stuck and he was calling out, ah! Another one fell into a ditch and broke his leg. <laughs> and it was, and Indra was not letting up. <laughs> and they were, ah! They're just going on and on and on. Finally, the leader of the Dacoids, he got a little bit of a, he was a Brahmin before he became a Dacoid. <laughs> it happens too. <laughs> and he uh, got a little insight that this person who was Nityananda, he must be the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And therefore he stopped and called him then the Dacoids the next morning, Indra, as soon as he thought like that, Indra stopped the rain and the hail. They picked themselves up. They were quite beat up from falling and getting stuck with stickers. And, and, and they, he said, well, we should surrender to him. So the next night, the leader of the Dacoids went to the house where Lord Nityananda is. He came to the door and then when he was standing at the door, all of Lord Nityananda's Gopals, they recognized who he was. They were little, you know, uh, 
apprehensive. Who, why is he coming here? But Lord Nityananda could understand. So then the Dakoi ran to Lord Nityananda and he just fell at his feet. He started crying. He grabbed the feet of Lord Nityananda and he said, oh my dear Lord, I am such a rascal, such a fool, such a demon. I wanted to cause harm to you, but I could not understand who you are. You are the Supreme Person. You are so kind, so magnanimous. And Lord Nityananda was so pleased that he just started rubbing his head like his own little child, treating him very lovingly. And then after that, he, he offered, he said, my dear Lord, I want to serve you. Lord Nityananda said, I have a service for you. I want you to make all the Dakwites into, into devotees. <laughs> You go, because he had a lot of influence, he was quite a powerful person. And so he went out preaching to all his friends, <laughs> colleagues, <laughs> that words. So that was the, the mercy of Lord Nityananda. He's very supremely merciful. He carries the mercy of Lord Chaitanya wherever he goes, and he adds his own mercy to it, and that mercy is the highest mercy. So the spiritual master is a manifestation of Lord Nityananda's mercy. And so when we get, when we get uh, the mercy of Lord, our spiritual master, we're getting the mercy of Lord Nityananda. And then when we engage in devotional service, we are under the care of Guru and God. And when we develop a taste for chanting the holy names, then Lord Chaitanya gives his special mercy. His mercy comes after Nityananda's mercy. So that mercy comes when he sees the devotees are eagerly chanting the holy name. And when that develops, and when we develop nam ruchi, that means sweet taste for development, then we become qualified to enter into Vrindavan. Only then. And then, then, then Srimati Radharani sends her girlfriends and to pull you in, and then you get the mercy of her associates, and then ultimately you get her mercy. And if you get her mercy, then you get Krishna's mercy. So it's a process. We want Krishna's mercy, but we have to get the mercy of our spiritual master. And then, once we get the mercy of our spiritual master, gradually we get Krishna's mercy through the process of Krishna consciousness. And by developing Nam Ruchi, a real strong desire to hear and chant the glories of the Lord, it's just a matter of time and we get the full mercy of the Lord. And everything becomes revealed through the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. It's so powerful. Now this is the process and that's why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come and he's come to Harisburg we call it, we don't call it Harrisburg, we call it Harisburg, uh, the place of Hari. <laughs> it's an interesting name. <laughs> Harisburg, spelled the same way with an extra R for emphasis. Harisburg. <laughs> so uh, yeah, this is a, the Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda wanted to come here and give his their mercy to all of you. And um, if we take advantage of that mercy by chanting the holy names and serving the Vaishnavas, Lord Chaitanya's process is three. Nam Ruchi, Vaishnav, Seva, Jiva, Dvaya. That's, that encompasses the whole process of Lord. What is that? Nam Ruchi means a taste for chanting. Vaishnav, Seva means to create, not create, but think of ways how to serve the devotees. It's not that we can just go along and do whatever we want. And, no, we have, to, we have to think of ways to associate with and serve the devotees. And of course, there's ways to do that, and, but we should be even proactive in that. Kind of, let me think of how ways I can serve the devotees. If we do that, then we are under the care of Lord Chaitanya for sure. And then the last one is Jiva Doya. Jiva Doya means to reach out to the unfortunate souls who don't have Krishna consciousness and give them that mercy. So that's Lord Chaitanya's reason for coming and he's inspiring his followers to take up this process and if we do, 
Taktvate ham purna janmani naiti mameti sarjana. Then you don't have to come and take birth in this material world. You might think, that's eh, not a bad place. You know, I got a car. And my wife, she agrees with me most of the time. <laughs> you, know, it's, uh, you know, it's not so bad. <laughs> but then there's birth, death, disease, old age. Adhyatmika, adhibhautika, daivika. The miseries coming from body, mind, misery come from other living beings, misery come from higher powers, and uh, all of the clashes along with all of the built-in miseries of this world. But that's, that's secondary. The ultimate misery is that we are away from Krishna. So a devotee suffers more from that than anything else. That I've come to this material world and I'm trying to make a a nice plan here to be happy, and I've left my true home with my true, uh, per, with, with the person who is actually my eternal lover, loving relationship, Krishna. So that's that's the real uh, deficiency of accepting this material world as all in all, is that we forgot about Krishna, we forgot who he is. And, what is our relationship with him? So that's the process of, of chanting the holy name will help us come back to that pure consciousness of devotion to the Lord. Hare Krishna. Any comments, questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. name, uh, it relieves uh, offering, mm -hmm. Krishna. offering obeisances on to whom relieves all material suffering. So how is the congregational chanting, you know, uh, reduces the or removes the material suffering? What's the question? Question, question is, you know, the verse we are reading today, I uh, offer my yeah. respectable obeisances to the Supreme Lord, the congregational chanting, whose holy name destroys all sinful reactions, and the offering of obeisances unto whom relieves all material suffering. Hmm. So when it says material suffering, what does that mean here? Material suffering? Yeah. Material life is suffering. <laughs> Krishna says that. Dukaliyam asasritam, that this place is temporary and it's miserable. When we become a devotee, our material sufferings start to decrease. And when we become a pure devotee, they're gone completely. <laughs> but material life is suffer simply suffering. Nobody's happy here. People want to be happy, and they even act like they're happy. But they're not. <laughs> because if there was happiness, there'd be no problems in the world. <laughs> but the world is full of problems because people are not happy. <laughs> it's just the way it is. This world is full of lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, envy. It's what it is. You're born into this world and you have to take on a material body. The scriptures say to take on a material body is unnatural for the soul. Not to have a, we might think, oh, well, I mean, everybody's got a body, it's just normal. It's not normal. It's normal if you're in the jail to have a prison suit. <laughs> but because you're in the jail, you accept that everybody else is like you, and therefore it looks normal, but you're in the jail. The material world is what it is. It's a jail. You're locked up by material desires. Jai Sisi Gornitai Ki Jai. So we think it's a nice place, but even if it is, after some time you've got to leave it. Jai Sisi Gornitai Ki Jai. So one who takes shelter of Gornitai, then there's no more suffering anymore. 
The real suffering is to be away from Krishna. That's the ultimate suffering. But because we don't know enough about Krishna, we don't even think we're suffering. But the more you know about Krishna, the more you realize how much you're suffering. Because Krishna's everything in this material world is just a shadow, reflection of the reality. This world is not real in the sense that it cannot fulfill your desire for happiness. It's not possible. But we try. We keep trying, thinking, yeah, if I just keep trying, my plans will finally come about sooner or later. But that's, that's called Maya. Maya keeps pushing you in a certain way to th give you the idea that if you just keep trying, you'll be happy. But that's Maya. Maya means what is not. So the soul is pure, but the soul is encumbered by this material body and accepts things that are contrary to its nature. It's like if you, if you put diesel fuel in a Ferrari car, it's not gonna run right. <laughs> the car will break down or won't even run at all. So we're accepting things that are contrary to our nature and we're trying to be happy based on that, which is not possible. So all material happiness, if we can use an euphemism, as material happiness is just one level above material suffering. It's another kind of suffering, but it looks like happiness. What it is, is simply a temporary relief from the suffering that we live in this material world. So that's all. So when you say, that's why Krishna not only says it once, he says it twice in the Bhagavad Gita. Dukalayam asasratam. This place is miserable and it's, and it's temporary. And he says, anitya asubam. It's temporary and it's for, it's with asu. Asu in sukha means happiness. And it's asuka without happiness. So we don't believe Krishna. We think, ah, yeah, well, you know, he's exaggerating. He's just kind of one of, he just wants to be, you know, he wants us to believe something that, you know, whatever, he's got a plan. No, he's telling you what it is. <laughs> and then when you, when you get cancer or you break your leg, and then you start realizing, hey, maybe this place ain't so good. <laughs> Somebody steals your car or you die. <laughs> you, we, you know, we think every misery is for everybody else, but not for me. <laughs> but there's only three ways you look at it from a perspective. You want something, you don't get it, you're not happy. You want something, you get it, doesn't give you the happiness you were expecting. You want something, you get it, it makes you happy for a little while, then it's gone. That's it, there's no law, there's no fourth principle. This is the way the world is. The more, you, the more enjoyment you get in this world, the more you will suffer. Because you have to lose it. Because that type of enjoyment will give you a kind of an attachment to that. And then at some point, you, you'll find it, you, you have to give it all up. So, therefore, a person who's not enjoying so much in this world by material standards is in a better position to make advancement because they realize this place is suffering. That's why it says that if you're too materially successful or if you're not at all, if you're too much under material needs, you, you're in a very difficult situation because you can't practice Krishna consciousness properly. So the middle road. So the, yeah, we have to understand what this world is. It's a place for your defeat. And if you want to blame somebody, Krishna says, it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> I made it like that. 
I mean, he said, and then he, then he gives the purpose. I made it like that so, because I love you. I don't want you to stay in this place. <laughs> I want you to realize and come back to me in devotion. So if you want the kingdom of God, there is a place for it. It's not here. <laughs> but if you're engaged in devotional service, you're gradually coming to that point of perfection. So stay in Krishna consciousness and uh, fo follow the process very strictly and gradually you'll free yourself from all material suffering and you'll be actually become happy. But that happiness is, it's Brahma Sokyam. It's not some happiness that comes by stimulation of the senses or the mind. It comes from the soul's natural propensity for happiness in connection with Krishna through devotional service. That's the real form of happiness. Other than everything else looks like happiness. You know, people, people have to ask themselves, am I happy? If you have to ask yourself if you're happy, that means you're not. When you're happy, you know. It's not a matter of questioning it. <laughs> he used to be at his little bumper sticker. Are we having fun yet? You know, that was the sticker on the car. <laughs> yeah. So if you want real happiness, which is, I think it was mentioned yesterday in Anuttama's talk, what is the actual goal of life is enjoyment. But people don't know where it is and where to find it. It's not here. There's an old story, a little little antidote. One man, he's he lost. He's apparently lost something, and he's looking on the ground. He's looking. He's looking. He's looking. He's looking and he's going on for some time. His friend comes along and says, "What are you looking for?" "Oh, I, I lost some money here." He said, "Oh, really? Can I help you look?" "Yeah." They're both looking. After some time. His friend says to him, are you sure you lost it here? He said, no, I lost it over there, but there's more light over here. <laughs> <laughs> That's material life. <laughs> Keep looking, <laughs> but it's not here. <laughs> but it does exist. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so take whatever material activities you have and offer them to Krishna in devotion and you can purify them and ultimately come to the platform of pure devotional service. Manaso dego and manaso deho geho yokichu arpilu tu arpade nanda kishore. Bhaktivinoda Akara says, my home, my family, my possessions, my very body, Nanda Kishore, it belongs to you. And it's true. It's not just some an, a nice poetry. Everything belongs to God. Whatever we have is given to us by the Lord through either directly or through the material energy. We have nothing. Nothing. We fell into this material world and whatever we have here is simply provided so we can somehow or other live here. But that's not coming from us. <coughs> All right, Krishna. <laughs> Any questions? More questions? Yes. I got one question. Uh, you were saying, you know, in the, you were explaining the day of Lord Chaitanya, you know, the whole day is just chanting the yeah. holy names. So, you know, we have deities of Gornetai, so when we put the deities to sleep, should we put on the Hare Krishna, uh, should we put on a Kirtan on the speaker at low volume? It's a pretty good idea. Yeah. It says if you want to make Lord Chaitanya happy, Lord Nityananda, do Kirtan. If you do everything else and you don't do kirtan, you will not get the mercy of the Lord. If you do kirtan and you forget everything else, you get the mercy. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, look at them. They're dancing. One foot's in front of the other one. Their arms are upraised. They're not serving out prashad. <laughs> they're, they're, they're dancing. <laughs> That means they're chanting and dancing. That's what they came to do, and that's what they came to inspire us to do. <laughs> it's not an accident they they're configured like that. That's their mood. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I mean, we can discuss it with temple authorities here and see if, if you can practically do it. I wouldn't be against it, but I can't, I can't make temple policy here. <laughs> you can decide. Okay. So everybody's, thank you for coming. Oh, you got another question? Oh yeah, okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Wonderful, wonderful class. It's very unfortunate that we are missing a lot of devotees. I hope they can listen to the YouTube, beautiful class, Maharaj. One question, Maharaj, you mentioned like it's a very, very rare opportunity that we have the, the appearance of Lord Karanga, what happens only once in one day of Brahma. So how as practicing devotees can we keep this urgency in mind when we are pr practicing, preaching, even doing the festivals, that what is the real goal and why it is so urgent? Uh, for our benefit as well as to get, you know, create the association, similar association, mm. association of devotees who are really very, they're dying for, you know, mm. for that kind of. It says that there's two things you should always r forget and two things you should always remember. This is from Shastra. Two things you should always forget. You should forget all the bad things that people have done to you. And that way you become humble. You should forget all of the good things you did to others. That way you don't become proud. These are two things you should always forget. And you should always remember that death can happen at every mo any moment. And you should always remember the holy name. These are the two things you should always remember. So if we remember that, hey, I'm in this material world, I could go at any moment. And all of a sudden, you never know, there's a little bug came into your body and now you got cancer. <laughs> Happens to everybody. Should I tell you a story? Yeah. Okay. It was, uh, we were preaching in Mumbai, in one hospital, JJ Medical Hospital in Mumbai. And the boys were coming and doing regular programs with the students on campus. And so we were coming regularly and having, and then this, many of the students were coming. Some were even coming to the temple. And so uh, after some time, one of the students that was a regular, he said to his friends who were also coming, I'm gonna stop coming to this program because I wanted to, to de dedicate myself to just study, 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 and I wanna graduate with top honors so he said, but I'll be back after I graduate. And that was the last year. He was in his last year. So he left. His friends continued. And then he studied, studied, studied. Graduation time came. He, he graduated top in his class, the best in the entire school. He got all kinds of honors. And so right after that, his friends reminded him, hey, now you're, you know, you accomplished what, now come back. He said, yeah, I know, but there's a party tonight. <laughs> I want to go to the party. So they said, all right. And the devotees were coming that same night to the, to the campus. So he went to the party, and he was dancing, dancing, dancing. And uh, while he was dancing on the floor, he had a heart attack and died. 23 years old. No medical history of any sickness at top in his medical, so all of a sudden, it's just died. And, and everybody was shocked, really shocked, and then broke the hearts of many. The devotees were also feeling really bad. But many of his friends started to realize, yeah. They got more serious. 
And so this was an example of a person who, from a material point of view, had good health, you know, nice ratings in school, was doing, he had a good future in, in front of him, at least materially. But all of a sudden, gone. <laughs> So, padam padam ya vi padam, this is the material world. We don't know when Yudhisthira Maharaj was talking to the Yaksha when they were on, they were refuge in the forest. That's a long story, but I'll get to the essence of the story. Yudhisthira Maharaj uh, had to answer these questions that this Yaksha was presenting. It's a beautiful story. It's in the, it's in the Mahabharata where the Pandavas were exiled in the forest. And he was asking him questions. And uh, the last question he asked, what is the most amazing thing in this world? Yudhisthira was quite intelligent. He, he answered all the questions perfectly. When he had to, got the last question, he said, what is the most amazing thing? He said, the most amazing thing is everyone is seeing their friends, family members, and others are dying, and they're thinking, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Just doesn't happen to me. <laughs> it happens to somebody else. <laughs> it's the most amazing thing in the world. So yeah, that, that's, you know, that is the way we think. We think everything, uh, but you know, time is moving itself, and, and providence is there. So one who knows that, it says that for, if you're really enthusiastic about material life, you should forget about death because you can't be enthusiastic. <laughs> but if you're enthusiastic about spiritual life, you should remember that death can happen at any time. So that way you become more serious in the execution of devotional service. Because as Bhakti Tirtha Swami wrote in his last book, die before dying. And he was saying that we have to somehow die to those things that are keeping us from really going to our ultimate destination when we die. In other words, die to all of our material attachments. So we have so much time in this world and Krishna will give you whatever time you need to finish up. But if you waste time in material life, and don't take Krishna conscious seriously, you know, you put yourself in a very difficult sort of circumstance. And for a devotee, there's no such thing as death. Death is simply the doorway to eternal life. And so it's just a transition stage, that's all. But for the non-devotee, it's the worst thing because, you know, they lose everything they live for. Prabhupada talks about many important people. Well, it was just like he said, many important people in India. I forgot he named a particular incident. They all died at once. By some calamity happened, some earthquake or something. When I was in Mumbai in 19, what, was, what year was that? 1999. It was a huge earthquake in Mumbai. I was sitting in in uh, our, our temple in Mumbai, and this was like Ram Mangal Arti in the morning, and there was a huge earthquake in, in, in Gujarat, which was really hundreds of miles away, but it shook where we were sitting. And then later on, we found out, you know, hundreds of people died in that earthquake. I don't know if maybe some of you were there or remember that. That was a big one in, in Gujarat, 1999. Just when we were on the lockdown in 2020, 2020 it was the end of the year, December 29th. I remember I was sitting in my room in, in Slovenia and it was a huge earthquake in Croatia, which is 150 miles away. And uh, it, uh, you know, my room started to shake. <laughs> I was thinking, what is this, you know? <laughs> Then we found out one city got, got practically destroyed. It was 150 miles away. But before that, in the same year, in March 22nd, I was sitting in my room in Croatia, and the whole I was chanting Japa, and the whole place started to shake. 
and the building was moving, and I was thinking, boy, I'm getting ecstasy from chanting. And <laughs> I was thinking, wow, wow, I, I finally reached perfection. You know? And then the devotee I was staying with, he said, Maharaj, it's an earthquake, let's get out. <laughs> So he jumped, I, I ran out the door. It just ruined my illusion, you know. <laughs> so again, we jumped out and went and sat in the car and drove away. I, I'm, the house I was in was on the epicenter. It was right on the fault of the earthquake. It was, was 5.9. It was a big, from the, on the Richter scale. It's quite big. And um, eight people died in Croatia that, during that one. I was in the middle of that one, so. I was thinking, hmm, Krishna's having fun. <laughs> so this is material world, you don't know. It's just the way it is. So, yeah. it's just, yeah. uh, of course, Krishna protects his devotees, but we still should live in a carefree way and think everything is going to be okay. We should understand that this principle is a foundation for making more advancement that this world is temporary, and my existence in this world is even more temporary. So let me, what am I doing in, the, in whatever time I have left, we should use it in the best possible way to become Krishna conscious. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati says, money is valuable, but time is precious. Money, he said, you can get it, you can lose it, and you can also get it again. But time goes in one direction. Yeah. So time is very valuable. So Use your time in a wise way. Of course, we have many responsibilities, but prioritize whatever we do around our spiritual life, because that is real life. Material life is simply uh, something that we've been forced upon because we left the material the spiritual world. We have to live in this world, but we don't have to become like attached to the activities of this world. We just do it as a responsibility. Our real business is to engage in devotional service. Okay, so thank you all for coming. I know the, yesterday was a big festival, so I could see the numbers have reduced today <laughs> because of that. But uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. And uh, the Riyatha Yatra, I think, was quite nice. How would you rate that in comparison to previous years? It was good? Yeah, well, that's that's the way we should think. How can we improve it? I would I give give my suggestion. Find a place that is more popularly frequented by people in general, because Ratha Yatra is for it's for the general people. We want to reach as many people as can. So if you can get maybe a some street in. Harrisburg downtown or somewhere in a more of a busy place, that would be, I think, would be better. You can always have your festivals on the side, but the actual cart festival should be with more and more people having exposure to Jagannath. Because if they simply see Jagannath, then they're guaranteed a human birth. For Ratiyatra is quite powerful, special mercy. So yeah, I don't know if it's doable, but you can try for it. And everything is, in Krishna consciousness, always shoot for something that's hard to get. And that way you can see the mercy of the Lord act. But you know, shoot for the rhino, chasing the rhinos. And if you get it, everyone will say, wow. If you don't get it, everyone will say, oh, difficult to do anyway. Don't be afraid to, you know, go out and stretch it a little bit. 
And in that stretching is Krishna's mercy. And the devotees should understand that, you know, this is your temple, and this is your, the deities are here. They're all, they're all basically for you. So whatever support you can give to the temple activities will be money in the bank, spiritual spiritual cash, <laughs> you could say. So try to assist in the, whatever temple activities. I think you had a lot of existence for the Ratha Yatra like that. It's good. And we want to bring more and more people in, and there's more and more things. I think one of the things we were talking about is getting Srila Prabhupada here in his deity form. That would be a, a, a very important step in bringing more and more people in. And we should have Prabhupada deity here, like that. And then you can think of other ways to... Yeah, Prabhupada never thought small. He said, that's my problem, I can't think small. He always thought big. And that's what spread the movement. <laughs> but, you know, within the realm of practicality, but a little bit beyond. <laughs> so, yeah, you can think maybe next year you can find a place which will be more frequent. It was a nice place for both the parade and for the festival, but there wasn't so many onlookers. We want to increase that. <coughs> mm -hmm. My mother, she went to the 1976 Rat Theatre in New York. She's, you know, when I, she's always tell me how she remembered that for her whole life. She just came. She, she had just happened to be there. I wasn't there. I was somewhere else, but she was. <laughs> Yeah, so these are these these events really can really stabilize people's life. Like one devotee was, we had Rathiyatra in the UK in London many years ago, and one devotee was chanting and he was chanting really nice. And one lady, she came running from the side, just one of the onlookers. She's crying like crazy. She goes up to the kirtan leader. What are you singing? What is it? I can't stop crying. <laughs> it really entered her heart in a big way, and she was feeling such emotion. First time she heard the holy name, but she heard it in a way that was really powerful. And it really changed her whole you know, demeanor. So, the, you know, we, can, we, we want to, we're not a movement for inclusiveness. Our, our movement is about spreading giving the mercy. That's why Lord Chaitanya came, to give us mercy, and he's asking us to do the same thing. It's mentioned, he says, I am a gardener, I have many fruits, and I'm tasting these fruits, and I'm also trying to de deliver these fruits. And these fruits are very sweet, but I'm only one person, so please help me. <laughs> T taste these fruits yourself, and then give them out to others. He's asking that, that's mentioned in, in the uh, ninth, chapter of the Adi Lila. He wants us to help us, help him spread Krishna consciousness. So there's so many ways we can do that. And the more we come together as devotees for hearing, chanting, associating, worshiping, and doing programs, the more we'll become Krishna conscious. And, you know, Don't worry, your material life will go on. <laughs> It'll somehow go on. <laughs> you don't need to be there <laughs> all the time. <laughs> okay. So what's next? Artie? Guru Puja first. Yes. Okay. <laughs>